Harlem, a place where Puff Daddy was born and raised. Sean John Combs, born 1968, born to Janice Combs, a model and teacher's assistant. Father, Melvin Combs, served in the U.S. Air Forces and was a drug dealer. His father died at the age of 33 when Sean was only two years old. Growing up in these streets was tough, even for Sean. A lot of things he went through started from right here, the streets of Harlem. Crooks become crooks. And robbers become robbers. And scammers become scammers. And little kids become everything they put their mind to. Whether they the biggest drug dealers on the block or the biggest killers on the block. Living here is part of survival. It's like a third world country. But we still here in the United States. At the start of the 1980s, Harlem was like a renaissance, a new beginning. Rap music was just getting started with Grandmaster Flash, Curtis Blow, Run DMC, many more. It was a time where people of color finally started to get some hope that they could make it out. Being the flyest rap artist or the dopest dancer, bebop, graffiti artist. Harlow was full of talent from musical dance shows to, to bebop and high skipping, you know. It's a beautiful city. It's Harlem, New York. Very diverse city. Multicultural. People came from everywhere. White, black, Hispanic. Everybody came to Harlem. Because it was the mecca of a place to be at the time. Harlem was the city that birthed so many greats from Tupac to Alicia Keys. Beautiful, talented artists that represent New York so well. All the way to Wesley Snipes. Who starred in some of the most greatest movies that we have. Spike Lee. Who produced some of the greatest movies that we ever had. Maya Angelou. Ooh, her voice so sweet. With her poetry. Highlighted the world with her talent. From Harlem. Are you from Harlem? You may not be from Harlem. But we all got a little Harlem in us. Like the great mayor, David Duncans, who served New York City as the mayor from 1990 to 1993. But with all the diversity, Harlem at heart was a city for black folks. Where black folks could express themselves in dance, in music, in all talents of the rainbow. People like Muhammad Ali walked free and was embraced. Harlem was a place where fashion met concrete. Beautiful styles and makeup and 
here dudes came from all over the world and landed right in Harlem. Taylor suits and cocoa butter hats and Molotov hats. Tap dancing, shows, art. That's Harlem. In Harlem, Diana Ross put on shows. James Brown danced all night. It was a land of talent and music and dance and comedy and poetry. A land where a nobody could become a somebody. But it's only one thing you had to escape the streets. It came a point where Harlem became a city of dope dealing, stolen cars, crackheads, money flash. No more about good fun, good wholesome fun. Everything was about becoming the man or the woman. Harlem was a city before its time. Nowadays, everybody go on Instagram to show off what they got on Instagram. But back in those days, you didn't need that in Harlem. All you had to do was come right outside. Come right outside. And you feel Harlem. You know what they say, once you use the rock, you become the rock. In Harlem, Harlem suffered a detrimental to black folks. Putting black folks back in time 10, 20, 30 years because of that crack rock. Nancy Reagan just said, just say no. But wasn't that easy for most many coming from broken families many coming from families who parents used the rock themselves and they sit there as little kids and witnessed it witnessed them cooking it up cooking it up in a pot rolling it up or putting it in that glass bottle to smoke that crack rock was Therapy for a lot of black in the city youths. Crack and black. That's what they call it on the media. If you was black, you use crack. Only because it was cheap to buy. The white folks in the other side of town was using just regular cocaine. That cocaine. They wasn't putting it in a pot and mixing it and breaking it down and making it cheaper. Getting bags for five, ten, twenty. The white folks is buying cocaine. 100, 200, 300, 400 a bundle. So you can market that in the hood. The only way you can market it is to break it down and to buy it cheaper than what you would sell it in the suburbs for people of low income that could hardly put food on their table. But after that, all that crack started flowing. A lot of celebrities didn't make it. A lot of people died. Some people used it one time and then they come back.
many black youths in Harlem still to this day is coming up short with trials and tribulations of life not everybody made it like Puff with a drug dealer father and a single mother single mother that held the secret of how his father died in order for him to move through life with a clear mind not everybody mother functioned like that a lot of people in Harlem their mothers was, was doped out anyway so the youth became violent mad upset at the world pissed off I'm going to take mine. You got kingpins coming home after doing 20 plus years. It's a cycle over and over. Never, never fails. Sean Combs is just that 1%. That 1% that made it. Many of his peers are underground right now. Man, if his peers are in prison right now, all coming from the early times of Harlem, getting money was in the air. That was on everybody's mind. How can we get out of this place we call home that's actually a nightmare? It was on Puffy Dad's mind, Melvin. The drug dealer. And many more just like him. How can I get my family out of this. Demon's lair. Called Harlem. The only way to do it. Is to turn against. Those around us. Become the big black wolf. Become the one who undercut everybody before they do it to you. Everybody want to be a clown, I guess. Being that my, um, my father, he was killed when I was three years old. I don't have like a lot of memories of my father. You know, they say, you know, you can't miss something you never had. So that, that's only a little, a little ways right, you know. Um, there's definitely been times as I, I've gotten older that I've missed my father. And, you know, his presence not being there, having somebody not to ask, like, manly advice. Um, and just things that you would ask your father. Also, but also things that you would celebrate with him, um, that would make him proud, you know. And, um, my father was a hustler, you know. He was a drug dealer, he was a hustler. And um, so I learned early in life that there's, there's only two ways out of that dead in jail. And, um, you know, made me work that even harder. So sometimes you can't just answer why things happen, but I definitely think the route that I went on, staying out the streets and, you know, hitting my books and trying to be somebody, um, I think he played a role in that. Mm -hmm. I think that even if we don't know our parents, we, we still have their DNA in us. Hustler's mentality, his hustler spirit, his drive, his determination, you know, his swag. Um, and, you know, he's going to be on my mind a lot today. You know what I'm saying? Um, my father's name was Melvin Combs. You know, Melvin's son, Sean Combs. Peace. Get back to eat my sandwich. But y'all make me cry. Well, I'm calling a good friend. 
We were good friends. We were good friends. We did a lot of business together. Of course, it was not a legal business, but we did a lot of business together. And uh, I was sorry to see what happened to him. That shocked the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the guy who did it, I'm glad he got what he got. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. And I know Melvin used to come to your club, the turntable, a lot. Yeah, yes, he did. He come there all the time. Melvin, Melvin was a, like a lady man. Yeah, he come there all the time. He come to my club all the time. Yes, he did. Can you say the name of your club? The Lord Price Turntable, with the second and Broadway. I met Sean Cone, Rob. I met him when I was a little boy. He used to come over to my house. His daddy used to bring him over to my house. He used to come see me on various businesses, and he used to bring him over to my house from time to time. But I met Sean uh, about a year ago. It's been a little better than a year ago. He heard I know the father, and he wanted me to tell him about the father. So I come over there, and I told him something about the father. But I didn't give him the whole story because he didn't impress me. He just asked me, Cash, and I told him, Cash, but if he pressed me, I would have told him the whole story. About his Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, all I know, but I didn't do that because he didn't press it. You know, if he act like he really wanted to know, he act like it was just another thing, so I didn't, I had to go. Right, and you knew him as Sean Combs, not as Puffy, or P. Diddy, right? No, I know my Melvin's son. I didn't know his name. <laughs> I know no Melvin's son. I didn't know his name. Yeah, he come there all the time. Melvin, Melvin was like a lady man. I say this guy, this guy Puffy Coin. You know who your father was, right? What did he? What did he? What did he? Puffy Coin. You know who your father was? He's talking about Puffy Coombs. Puff Daddy. Puff Daddy. Yeah, his daddy. His dad was a dealer. Puff Daddy. You know who your father was? Oh, Melvin. Melvin Coombs. Yeah, that's right. He yeah, used to be a mother. You know, me and Melvin, me and me and Melvin, his mother. What is Melvin used to bring over to my house about every day, every every other day, a couple of times a week at least. And my daughter had a little one of those little rocking horses. She would let him ride, and she used to push him off the white horse. I said, look at him now, he can build that ride off a million dollar bills. Yeah. That guy got rich, man. He did good, man. I'm I'm, I'm proud to see him out there like that. Was Melvin, that was Melvin Combs. Son, I just saw me I'm night. glad. I'm glad. I'm glad he did it. I'm glad he went on. I, I, I pray for this kid, man. He did. He doing good. I just saw him the other night when I went to see your movie, Frank. I'm, I... Something that would change the course of my life forever. I don't talk about this often. I was raised by a single mother in Harlem. Dad, Mr. Melvin Combs, died when I was three years old. My mother always told me that he died in a car accident. But something about that, it, it just didn't feel right. Something was in my soul that was telling me otherwise. So as soon as I got here, I went to the library and I did some research. I used the microfilm at Founders to search through all the newspapers. When I typed in my father's name and the day he died, I read in the Amsterdam news that he had been murdered and a drug deal going bad. Right there in that library, I realized there's nothing greater than a mother's love and desire to protect her child. nothing. I also decided that I would live my life in a way to make her proud. I decided to embrace the entrepreneurial spirit of my father, but in an honest way. God bless you, Melvin Combs. I could feel you right next to me. But in an honest way, in a legal way, by earning, scraping, working harder, believing in myself, and most importantly, making the most of the blessings that God blessed me with. Confirmed by several sources, including Usher. The multi-platinum selling recording artist visited the Howard Stern Sirius 
XXM show in 2016 and spoke about his early career with Bad Boy, attending Puffy Camp, the upcoming Hands of Stone film, and much more. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> Usher and Stern had a pretty incredible conversation about his rise starting from the days of being on Diddy's Bad Boy record label. The legendary singer told Stern that he went to Puffy's Flavor Camp, which was how he would learn to become a star. The place was like just filled with chicks and orgy. Initially, Puffy brought a bunch of women into a room with 14-year-old Usher to see if he would become nervous. Usher said that he won that battle. He also revealed that he was a 14-year-old kid singing about sex when he had never had sex at that point in his life. He also hung around artists like Biggie Smalls, Lil' Kim, Faith Evans, and much more. Usher also revealed that his agenda was a little different, and he also spoke about talking to Jay-Z, who was quoting lyrics from Usher's first album. During his stay at Diddy's house, Usher has allegedly revealed that he witnessed gay parties, and there are rumors that he is a victim of such parties himself. Recently, a TikTok video was released that featured interviews of rappers and singers speaking about Puff Daddy's crazy and reported all-men parties in different interviews and questions about the rapper's heterosexuality. So I followed him the whole time. I remember watching Puff at the Beverly Hills Hotel, I'm filming this, and it's a pool party that is a ridiculous moment. The video opens with Jamie Foxx being interviewed and speaking about Sean Puffy Combs' secret parties that supposedly featured young men. Rappers like 50 Cent made fun of Puffy regarding the types of parties he'd make where there were all men and supposedly even younger men, as it happened with Usher when he went to Flavor Camp. The video also has an interview when Howard Stern and co-host Robin Quivers interview the R&B singer Usher about his beginnings in New York City when he went and lived with Puff Daddy when he was a teenager and addressed the parties and celebrations that they had at the so-called Flavor Camp. Without being too specific, Usher spoke about how he got to know the lifestyle, but did not know if he would participate and indulge since it was pretty wild. Later in the video, it was suggested that Sean Puffy Combs and Usher used to share a bed when Usher was just 10 years old, and they would wrestle for frosted flakes. So if the likes of Usher, what went on in Diddy's household, of course, Quincy did as well. You see, in the early 90s through to the noughties, Diddy was in a serious relationship with Quincy's mother, model Kim Porter, who tragically died in 2018. Kim and Diddy were one of hip-hop's darling couples, much like Beyonce and Jay-Z and the Bad Boy Records boss had no problem taking in her son from a previous relationship. In fact, it appears he did it without a second thought, instantly building what would become their expansive family unit. Quincy's biological father is R&B singer Al B. Shore, and you only need to look at Quincy to see that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree in terms of their physical resemblance. You're woke <laughs> to be loved by anyone. But the star actor's primary father figure was Diddy, who took him in when he was around three years old and raised him as his own. This a sign of just how much Diddy truly loved Kim, who was also mother to Christian, Delilah, and Jesse. It wouldn't be a stretch to assume that growing up in a famous household with perks and many famous aunts and uncles, such as Mary J. Blige and Jay-Z, meant Quincy had a super privileged life, but all that came at a cost. Something he confirms as he once revealed, growing up, I was able to be exposed to different things which create who I am today. Everything that I've been through, all the cities that I've grown up in, all of that creates the person you see. Are you close with your dad at all? I, I am, you know, nowadays, uh, but not as much as I'm, you know, as close with uh, Puff. While Quincy was provided with a tight-knit family made up of his mom, adopted dad, siblings, and grandmother, his relationship with his biological father, Al B. Shore, was initially strained over the years and highly publicized. In 2008, Quincy published an open letter to his biological dad, accusing him of being an absentee father. Sean Combs is the person whom I look up to and appreciate as a father, Quincy wrote in the piece published by Global Grind. He is the one who helped mold me into the person I am today, and I will always try to live up to his expectations. He has always been supportive of me, and I will forever love and respect him. As for Al B. Sure, he added, throughout my life, I've always wondered about him. Where was he? What was he doing? And most importantly, was he even thinking about me? The absence of my father has given me a better understanding of what type of man I am going to be before crediting his mother's love, support, guidance, and strength. 
the open letter created the space for dialogue between the estranged father and son, with Al B. Shore issuing a public response, stating that he was confident he and Quincy would work it out. He was right, as they have since reconciled and are in a much better place after working to build their relationship. It was just a figuring out of things. It wasn't a transition or anything like that, Quincy said of having both his biological and adopted fathers in his life. While publicly receiving praise from his children, Diddy has also been accused of being a terrible dick. What's going on, my brother? How you doing? Oh, man, man. man. Yo, it's Groove here. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday, yeah, yeah, birthday yeah. to you. Woo! Woo! Happy birthday to you. Woo! <laughs> Happy birthday. You're fabulous. <laughs> the only nigga that got the name that I want. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Thank you, my brother. Um, yeah. Let's take a shot for that, boy. <laughs> Oh, my mouth a little dry. I need to drink some more. Okay, Sam. But, um... No, it's your show today, you guys. No, the, the, the one thing I've been... No, no, no you got questions. Groove, okay. Groove! Talk, Groove! Come here, let him grow up, bro. Yeah, fat! And he go, when they do, when he do it, he says <laughs> things, he doesn't even know what he's saying is like fruity. Zam told him to flow your shit. Hey, yo, Rastafari, Rastafari. Hey, hey, yo. Don't do that. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I said. No, Let me pick it up. That's why I got to pick it up from right no. there. This like, go this go I got to pick it up from right there. Look at this nigga. This is a very nigga. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 bro. Take care of him. Come tell the story. Bro, 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 we intoxicated. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, oh, Groove, oh, you Groove, you helping me build that yo, beautiful, yo, nice guy, Rastafari brand of yours, huh? Yeah. I, I come see in, you, man. I'm walking in at that hall, the hallway right there. Bag at? Mr. Lee, what? Yeah, I love this drink. Where you put my bag you? I like at? when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, where you put my bag Daddy, at? Daddy, I like Mr. when you're oh, when you right scrambling right and scraping for shit. No, 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 I got I notes like that. You know, I'll be practicing. I got Yeah, there you go. Got your notes. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to go over with that one. Make a wish. That one? Just blow it out. Your birthday every day. Every day is your birthday on Drink Chats, goddammit. I'm in. Okay. Oh, we ain't fuck up that. No, I got notes now. That. I'm trying to get my life together. I'm trying to get my life. I want to taste the vegan Yo, cake. Yo, Fendi, what's going on? Uh, like, just see where I look, you look back me? on where I became. Mm. Did you miss me, though? Mm. For real. Because we, I'm saying, miss, it seems like a thing. I miss it was his birthday with party. Puff, man. Man, I miss but party I'm talking about for your birthday. Huh? Why won't you party with me for your birthday, man? Come on, come on. No, 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 this is me and you. Oh, man, I need a shot. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Shot, okay. This bro. is mine? Okay. Yeah, I just have a shake. It's I'm all in. together. Me I'm and in. you. I'm eyes. In. Eyes. 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 Let's do eyes. it. Spilling it all over. Eyes. It's going down. That's that French vanilla? Yeah. Oh, me and Jay. Oh, me and Jay. We got Jay. Make some guy to me. Seem like Puff. And Tupac was like a couple, it seemed like to me. Uh, it was just a lot of weird shit going on, you know what I'm saying? The vibes ain't there. I guess that, that's what Tupac was talking about, the Illuminati and shit. It's like Vivica Fox was with this big gay man. He was 6'9". They called him, his name 6'9". He had the red hair with a big old booty and shit. Nobody was gay in him. Like, what the fuck is going on here? It's just a lot of, a lot of weird shit, dude. You know what I'm saying? That shit, it ain't right. You know what I'm saying? I guess that's what Tupac, I guess he wanted to get up out of the Illuminati or something. But I, I seen her yet. Matter of fact, MC Light pulled off with Tanisha Arnold. You know what I'm saying? In her brand new 560. Black one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that shit weird, dude. Yeah, that's some weird ass shit going on, you know? Yeah. And what was Tupac doing at the party, yo? Him and Puff was there together. They was there, you know what I'm saying? That's why I don't know how they fucking fell out or nothing like that. They was road dogs. You know what I'm saying? They ain't even got pictures of them. He got on that uh uh that blue sweater with the turtleneck. Him and him hugged up like this with the black hat. Have you ever seen that picture? No, I don't recall, but I'm pretty sure I came across it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That picture there, that they was at that party that day. Yeah, it's just like a bunch of weird shit, that whole fucking yeah, that shit weird, dude. Yeah, bunch of, uh, it ain't right. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm not no gay bastard or nothing. I mean, none of that shit, but that shit ain't right. You know what I'm saying? That shit, that whole party was weird old out. Yeah, and it was Jada Pickett. But. You saying that, you saying the whole party was weird. What did you see at the party that made it weird? I mean, I'm confused. 
I guess it was the Illuminati. It's just weird. I know I wouldn't want to be part of no shit like that. You know what I'm saying? will advocate for you. Because, see, I know something that a lot of people don't know. I know that you and Kim Porter had a sit-down right before she left us. We decided to do the book because um, I'm not a rapper, obviously, or anything like that. But I've been in the business and been around the business. Well, some of the things in the book cover Diddy's gay relationships, footage of those encounters, the men he slept with, STDs, Diddy giving Usher an STD, and the explosive encounter between Diddy and Usher's mom, Mary J. Blige being pregnant by Diddy, and of course, she had an AB, the beatings Kim took, pushing him down the steps in 2007, and him breaking his foot. Jaguar Wright has broken her silence on Diddy, settling his lawsuit with Cassie, and she claims Cassie knows what Diddy did to his ex, Kim Porter, when she tried to expose him. For years now, rumors have been swirling that Diddy had Kim Porter eliminated because she was planning to write a tell-all book. And several people who worked for Diddy claimed that they witnessed Diddy putting his hands on Kim. Uh, when they were at, at home, at Kim's house on 110th Street, he wanted to, you know, put his hands on her in the wrong way. And then Jaguar Wright directly accused Diddy of heinous crimes, including allegedly poisoning Kim Porter. And isn't it interesting how Diddy never tried to sue Jaguar for defamation? Well, Jaguar is back, and she revealed in a new interview that Kim warned Cassie about Diddy shortly before she died, and that Cassie knows exactly why Kim is no longer with us. So could Cassie's lawsuit lead to an investigation into Kim Porter's death? And what exactly did Kim tell Cassie in their last conversation? And I know Kim had some very good advice to give you, and I believe that, that this is why things are happening as they're happening now. Just 24 hours after Cassie filed an explosive lawsuit against Diddy, accusing him of DV, SA, and trafficking, they settled the suit for an undisclosed amount. However, this just made Diddy look even more guilty because after Cassie filed, Diddy's lawyer publicly accused her of trying to blackmail Diddy. And yet, just hours later, Diddy suddenly decided to pay up. See, Diddy literally never pays anyone. It took him over 30 years to pay his former artists. So there's definitely more here than meets the eye. He didn't put any effort to clear his name. And instead, he immediately put a lid on Cassie's lawsuit, which can only mean one thing. There has to be more that he's hiding. Now, something that a lot of people were confused about is why Cassie agreed to settle. Well, she didn't have any other option. She filed a civil lawsuit, which means settlement was the only possible outcome. Only the government, a.k.a. a prosecutor, can file cases in criminal court, so it's up to them to open a criminal investigation against Diddy. But this was actually a really smart move on Cassie's part because her lawyers used trafficking as the foundation of her lawsuit, which means they left the door wide open for criminal and federal charges to be brought against Diddy. It was also smart that Cassie refused to settle privately with Diddy before filing a lawsuit because by making it public, she protected herself and her family. Plus, for a high-profile lawyer to have even touched this case means Cassie's evidence was real and compelling. Now, speaking of evidence, many things are starting to surface online, including this video of Cassie curled up on the floor under a blanket while Diddy taunts her. What you gotta say now? You ain't got shit to say when you put your girl on the snap. Also, Cassie's old selfie recently resurfaced, showing her with a busted lip and trauma to her head. Cassie shared this photo in 2014 during a trip to Dubai with Diddy, and at that time, blogs reported she had an accident while riding an ATV. But this isn't what her face would look like after an ATV accident. Instead, it looks like one of the incidents she describes in her lawsuit. Now, a lot of people are saying this story is scarily similar to what happened to Kim Porter, Diddy's ex-girlfriend who died under mysterious circumstances in 2018. To give you some context, Diddy and Kim dated on and off from 1994 to 2007, and during one of their splits, Kim started seeing Shakir Stewart, who worked at Def Jam. Diddy reportedly became furious after learning about Kim and Shakir, which led to a heated argument during which Kim sustained a broken nose. Most of the reports about this incident have been scrubbed from the internet. However, there is one article published... Diddy spotted at the home where his ex suddenly and mysteriously died. 
her good friend Kamora Lee Simmons appearing inconsolable at the house, 47-year-old Porter's body found after a desperate call to 911. EMS 14, respond with engine 76 on scene of the cardiac arrest. Of course, many people thought this was highly suspicious, and one of them was Kim's ex-husband, I'll be sure. In July 2020, Al shared a since-deleted video of himself and wrote, I just found this footage from the morning I learned of Kim Porter's murder and how it ripped the soul from my physical body. I do know very clearly that Kimberly didn't just check out all of a sudden over pneumonia. Al V also added the hashtag, don't let the love songs fool you, seemingly referencing Diddy's tributes to Kim. And then in November 2021, Al V posted a throwback photo with Kim and claimed she told him she was running and he advised her to call the FBI. Al V also added in the comments, you would never believe what she went through. And get this, just months after he posted this, Al B was hospitalized with multiple organ failure and spent two months in a coma. He managed to pull through, however, he's been very silent since then and stopped mentioning Kim in public. However, Jaguar Wright is not staying silent, and back Sorry. in December, Bye. she told Real Life Productions that Kim's initial autopsy showed she was poisoned. Kim died from pneumonia, but there's the first coroner's report that said that she died. It, it was ruled a homicide, and they found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. Jaguar also claimed that all these people who dealt with Diddy and then died or got sick were planning to release tell-all books and documentaries. Writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book before she died. And I'll be sure was working on the documentary of his life. And then he goes into a coma. Jaguar is now speaking out again. And in a new interview with Storm Monroe, she offered her support to Cassie and claimed that Cassie knows what happened to Kim because Kim warned her about Diddy before she died. I will advocate for you. Because, see, I know something that a lot of people don't know. I know that you and Kim Porter had a sit-down right before she left us. I don't know Orlando Brown's story, and he claimed that Diddy gave him that gok gok shmagok, if you know what I mean. Yo, Diddy, you gave me the ooshka smoosh You gave me the ooshka smoosh the smoosh mash. Diddy. Yeah, son. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You gave me the ooshka smoosh I love it, yo. He is crazy, but oh, let's not even get started on 50 Cent and how he has been steadily exposing Diddy over the years. There was a time he shaded Diddy on IG and said, sorry, I can't no longer help you guys. Soon you will all be gay and happy. You are all now left under the leadership of Putty Daddy. Report to the nearest rainbow. There's also that time he went on the breakfast. Told my he want receipts. Let's start with your mother. Your mother got the receipts. Yeah, everything is in your mother name. That's the one who got the receipts. You need more proof? Biggie ain't here, so Big can't give you no receipts. He dead. Craig Mack can't give you receipts. He dead. What are you talking about? Who else? Black Rob can't give you receipts. He dead. And everybody else, you may sign paperwork so they can't talk about what I'm talking about. I'm the only one with the gut to not sign it. Because I ain't need the money. All money ain't good money. Remember that. Remember that. Remember that. So I'm sure you know. You see, May shocked everyone when he decided to leave Bad Boy to become a pastor at the age of 19. The decision sparked a lot of dispute because why would a 19-year-old rapper who already conquered the charts suddenly decide to leave it all behind and decide to become a minister? Well, he probably saw something coming for him, but when he was asked, he said he decided he wanted to better his life, and it was more than just making money. The reason why I, why I decided to start rapping. I just wanted to better my life. I wanted to do something better for my life. Not all the time, money is the best thing for your life. He was able to leave Diddy's label without much hassle, even though he had a long-term contract. Though he never got any royalties for his album, Welcome Back, he still managed to come back five years later and then express his desire to leave again while on an interview with Puffy. <laughs> He eventually came back again, and this time exposing Diddy and even went live on Instagram to out him. When I see the hurt and the pains of other people, 
on Bad Boy that motivates me to say something so I don't be deemed as a person who just made a bunch of money and turned a blind eye. He also exposed all the unfair treatment they got from Diddy, including getting starved, all in an Instagram post that's now deleted. He said, your past business practices has purposely starved your artists and been extremely unfair to the very same artist that helped you obtain the Icon Award on the Iconic Bad Boy label. He even had an interview where he talked about how he never got paid, even if he was the only one behind all the Bad Boys hit songs. Beats, Wayne getting the money, you ain't getting the publishing. You ain't getting the respect. And I don't think you're like that. Anyway, Diddy came out to respond to Mace's accusations and said he never took anything from anyone and that he only gave opportunities. If you think that I'm a scumbag that would ever steal anything, my name is Diddy. Sean Cone. I never took nothing from nobody a day in my life. All I've ever given is is opportunity and 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 more money than a person was making. So when I hear like or I see things and I'm like, wow, this 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 vibe that they got on me, like I'm big red or something. I came here, I had to open up the doors. So you saying you I don't made, you, 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 you don't made, steal from artists is what you saying? Never. He also insinuated that Mace was just looking for someone to blame when he was the one that left the contract to a certain point and the money is running low you want to you got to run this hustle to try to find somebody to blame he also talked about how he would fight for his reputation and legacy and that he has his own receipts so his accusers should come with theirs mace thing you know i did one album with mace one album how much money do you think i owe this guy one album and then he became a fake pastor and went and con people, and then y'all gonna let him throw dirt on the God's name? We going, we, I wrote each and every one, and each and every body, and everybody could come and step up, bring your receipts, but I'm not playing. I'm back outside and I'm fighting back for us, and I'm also doing, do a little fighting back for me. You know what I'm saying? So, how much money does, and I'm, I'm just throwing this out, how much money does somebody like a Mace owe you? Because the reason I Mace say that. Mace owes me $3 million. That's <laughs> facts. I got the receipt. Second album, he gave money to do a second album, never delivered. Did the album, never delivered. Delivered, you know okay. what I'm saying? And I'm not gonna go back and forth with Mace, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going back and forth with nobody. It actually became somehow funny when Diddy said Mace thing. You know, I did one album with me. One album. How much money do you think I owe this guy? I mean, so you do owe him something. And what's worse, he went as far as calling Mace a fake pastor that owes him $3 million. And then he became a fake pastor and went and conned people. And then y'all gonna let him throw dirt on the God's name? We the whole time. I remember watching Puff at the Beverly Hills Hotel filming this, and it's a pool party that is ridiculous money. Jamie Foxx is the latest celeb to speak out on Diddy's rumored secret parties with younger men. However, fans are saying the real truth is even more disturbing, and Jamie is probably holding back because he doesn't want people to know the wild things he was doing at those parties. Rumors about Diddy being on the DL and having a fondness for younger guys have been circulating for years, and multiple people have come forward to say they personally witnessed some crazy stuff taking place at Diddy's infamous house parties. You know, when you Google his name, there's a rumor that pops up uh -huh. that he was Diddy's boy to him. Oh shit! Can't like, wait to run into him again. See, what you gonna say to him? Puffy was playing with your booty in Miami. <laughs> you know it was in Miami. But what about Jamie? Arms for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. To learn <laughs> some Flavor Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. And you're gonna go to Puff Daddy's. He's in the '90s. Do you understand what that's like? And pay attention to this next part. When Usher was asked if Diddy's place was full of girls, Usher said that's not exactly true, and you could tell he was thinking about whether to spill the whole truth or not. The crazy stuff that people have saying is actually true. Meanwhile, rumors also started recently floating around that Diddy tried to turn several rappers, including Ja Rule and YK Osiris. Diddy's former bodyguard Gene Deal claimed that he actually witnessed Diddy buying adult toys and. Then later that same day, he stood guard while Diddy and Ja Rule were doing some freaky stuff in a hotel room. And then he, he picked like a, quite a few of them down. I'm like, you're okay. He put them in the bag. So when I went by there and I looked up there I, and it said butt plugs, Puff and Ja Rule runs out the room. Puff got his towel, Ja grabbing his towel, but they butt the naked. He just looked, Puff looked at Ja. He said, yo, Ja said, you ain't want to go in that room because there's a lot of freaky going on. <laughs>
<laughs> and while some fans accused Gene of lying for clout, many others jumped to his defense saying that there are simply too many people saying the same thing and everybody can be telling the same lie. Gosh, if people don't know the rituals and initiations it takes to get into the music industry by now, you might want to do your research, one fan said. Don't just be saying this guy's lying. It's a sick world out there and nothing is as it seems. Now, when it comes to YK Osiris, who, by the way, is 29 years younger than Diddy, rumors about him being Diddy's secret boy toy have been swirling around for a couple of years now. When YK appeared on The Breakfast Club in August 2022, he was asked about the craziest rumors he'd heard about himself, and he couldn't keep a smile off his face while Charlemagne was reading gossip about his secret trip to Jamaica with Diddy. They say, uh... Nah, I ain't gonna say that. I heard about that though. But I ain't about to say that. But what? what was I ain't it? about to say on, on, on my side. You and Diddy. You and Diddy. Yeah. yeah, you and Diddy. You and Diddy what? Diddy. No. They said he was. Him no. and Diddy what? I'm just saying the rumor. I ain't never heard this one. They said he was. How you knew that? How you, how you know now I'm about to Google because I ain't never I heard this one. Yeah. Because like, you, that's the nobody would ever say that one. Oh that's yeah. Like, so here goes envy. They said that he said he was Diddy's boy toy. What? I was in Jamaica with him. Oh, I see it now. See. Is that well, what you're Osiris in Jamaica with his alleged boo Diddy. <laughs> See? Can we talk about Diddy new boy toy? Why can't I'm sorry? Why you did this to Diddy, man? It's messed up, man. Nah, I Why don't. you even bring that up, I'm Envy? Just, I'm just asking about rumors so he can clear it up. That's what the breakfast yeah, that, I didn't even you know that. That ain't nothing that needs to be cleared up. Who believed that? That ain't nothing to be cleared up. I say, I don't know what happened about that. When pressed to answer if Diddy really took him on a private trip, YK denied it. However, many fans jumped to the comments to say that his body language was saying something else. I was laughing. Yeah. Sorry. yeah was okay. you in Jamaica with Diddy, though? Yeah, what, he what, said, what yeah. <laughs> No. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I was uh, with a shawty. All right, but Diddy was there. No, he was a whole other different. Oh, so they just made this up? Yeah, they made it up, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Yeah, he was in a whole other different area. Like, he was. Like... <laughs> have you ever met Diddy? Yeah. Okay, did he ask you to party? Yeah. Party, party? <laughs> Man. <laughs> <laughs> His facial reaction and body language confirming it, one fan said. It is so true that he's literally feeling it under his skin and it's uneasy. Feeling like being cornered, he almost walked out jumpy guilty. He can't even look them in the eye and his hands are all over, don't know what to do, pretending to be busy like it has nothing to do with the conversation and don't want to be a part of it. And another person added, he looks like Diddy's type too. He needs media training so he can learn how to spot a lie. Now as for Jamie Foxx, he talked about Diddy's crazy party in several interviews, but every time it seems like Jamie was censoring himself and choosing his words very carefully. I'm following Puff, following Puff, and his parties were like amazing. I'm in Philly one day. I, drive, I fly to Philly, town car, same business, go up, but Puff say this party, Playboy, this party right here, I see a million and a half dollars. I said, nigga, what? You spent a million and a half dollars on this party? What's also weird is that Jamie mentioned that Nick Cannon used to sleep in his house when he was 13 years old. And this reminded a lot of fans of the whole Diddy and Usher situation. Watch who benefited from it. Nick Cannon used to sleep on my couch. Wow. 13 years old. Wow. He'd be in one part of the house. He'd be like, can I, nigga, go back in there. You can't, uh, <laughs> the fuck back in there. You can't come in here. And he'd be like this, like this, right? He slept on the couch. Fans are now saying that Jamie probably witnessed and possibly even has had one of the worst fates from crossing paths with Diddy. All that glitters isn't gold, and what was perceived as a glamorous celebrity relationship filled with vacations, gifts, and romance really turned out to be riddled with abuse, assault, and emotional trauma. Cassie's rise is due to several factors, including her connection with producer Ryan Leslie. Her collaboration with him introduced her to the industry life. They created the song Me and You that was posted on her MySpace page. Even Eventually, she was connected with Diddy and he took an interest in her and took it upon himself to take her under his wing, including signing her to Bad Boy Records and making her his trophy. When Cassie signed the Bad Boy contract, she was in a 10 album deal, which already sounds crazy considering she wasn't a strong artist. Her first ever album was released under Bad Boy and although her songs were doing well, she did get backlash because her performances, including her BET performance, was really bad. It looked like she had social anxiety. She wasn't really giving the audience what they wanted. Diddy came to her defense and you could see the cockiness and pimp daddy persona that Diddy gave off. What's up y'all? It's your friendly neighborhood international rap mogul superstar, designer extraordinaire, actor, marathon runner, father, friend. You know, I do it all baby. TV producer. Enough about me. It's my homegirl Cassie right here. And we're coming to you live from our photo shoot for ID Magazine. She has her album in stores right now. Cassie, go get it. Y'all know the hit single, Me and You. And you know, we always 
communicate to you guys first. There's some things that have been on my mind that I asked Cassie if I could address. Um, when you're a recording artist, you know, you have good days and you have bad days. Um, a lot of times people don't understand that. Today I want to talk about how I feel as a record executive working with young talent. Um, when you sign by somebody that's young, you have to be there with them through their ups and their downs. My homegirl Cassie right here, she had a, a semi, you know, I would say it was a whack show. She had a whack, she had a pretty whack show on BET, you know, um, did not perform at the level of the bad boy excellence, I would say. That's keeping it all the way funky, you know? But it's very important that y'all understand that bad boy, we with our artists through their growth period, through their bad shows, through their good shows. You know, we, we love them when their records are hot. We love them when they trip and fall. At Bad Boy, we there for people through ups and downs. For all the new young artists out there that think this is easy, it's not easy, you know? You have to be able to fall down and right. get up. Granted, she had a wax show, but she also got the hottest song in the clubs, and she ain't never gonna give up, because she down with Bad Boy. Every show, she'll keep getting better and better and better. That's what life is all about. So all you haters out there, kiss my mother this interview was pretty interesting considering Diddy created Making of the Band. Diddy was very rough on how his artists came off. He put them through a series of challenges to prove that they could actually handle the heat. We're back. Never fear. Your boy Diddy is here with a new season of Making the Band. Last season, we tried to make an international female superstar group. Move your body, shake your body, get naughty, naughty. It didn't quite work out. It's called making the band. There's no band for me to make out of this group. Understand what made I've been through. This year alone, I done contemplated suicide two or three times. I done pictured my brother walking in, finding me dead. I cried a few times thinking about leaving my son. Because you just get tired of life. It's like no matter what you try to do, you just got to keep battling. Niggas got their foot on your neck, niggas want to see you fall. And it be niggas, you know what I'm saying, like, it's this nigga Puffy. And my main motherfucking reason why I really hate fucking life, though. Like, people don't even understand. Like, I don't even give a fuck. But I've never been to a point where I've thought of suicide my whole life. Never. I think I'm a gangster. You know, I, 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 you know, I partake in my shell street things that might occur. I, I apologize for my sins every night. But me personally, my own life, the thought alone, I was telling my dog, I'm like, I don't even know how I start thinking like that. Because I don't, it done got so bad where well, I done had it all and done fell to the bottom. How do you come back from that when, when you battling a giant? Like, no matter what you do, it ain't got nothing to do with your skill no more, because your skill is 90% better than any nigga that's out there right now, and the world knows it. But it ain't your skill, because you can't even, you can't even get where you're going because of the world is built on relationships. So if a nigga fuck with you, that's saying they don't fuck with Diddy. That, 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 that's, that's basically Khaled, Ross, all them niggas chose. You think I don't know them niggas? Them niggas ain't never gave me a verse. Them niggas ain't never did. Now, when I first seen Ross, man, after that shit, nigga said, man, I love you, man. You know what you did for our city? I love you, man. In the middle of the club, my nigga. Nigga ain't never gave me, you know, nigga ain't never called back and say, hey, man, like real niggas spoke with me. Every artist in Miami look out for each other. You ever seen any one of them niggas do anything for me? Them niggas got they deal on the strength of me, man. Cali, them, and, and, and Diddy relationship is built off me, man. That's why them niggas don't fuck with me. That's why they can't fuck with me. Them niggas love me. I had love, man. I was the only nigga screaming Khaled name when he wasn't shit, bro. Every city, too. Every radio station, every every event. Khaled, the number one DJ with me, nigga. Because I'm a real nigga like that. Ross was my favorite rapper before he ever fucking touched the Diddy hand. But notice how after the band, Diddy put his hands on them niggas. A few months later. Oh, he want to be they because he want to. That was a spit in my face. Because me and him know what happened. Me and him had the conversation inside the office. I know what we're supposed to take, though. Uh, I just don't come from where I can be purchased, man. I ain't come from that, man. I came from, man, sleeping on dirty clothes, man. I used to fill up my clothes. We used to sleep on fucking pillowcases, man. I used to wear my, my fucking 
We used to wash our clothes out, hang them bitches in the bathroom, go to school, mute do my nigga. So I can't be purchased, bro. I've been through a lot. My family been through a lot, bro. For 20 years, man, it's like, and people are like, oh, why you ain't, why you ain't, why? Because, bro, anybody that signed me, basically, I don't, I can't pr prove that this nigga hating on me, but I can see through my peers' actions how a nigga like Khaled can't even fuck with me. He can't even, if he want to. And I'll ask you, after ask yourself, oh, damn, Khaled, when we got beef? Damn, Ricky, when we got, why you cutting checks to all these other niggas? You ain't, ain't now, man, and now what all this Ricky Ross ever signed fuck with me, man? I went through 40,000, man. Ain't now nigga Ricky signed that can go through 40,000, man. Ain't now nigga Kanye signed that can run through 40,000. Ain't now nigga, none of these niggas ever signed that can run through 40,000, man. And be noticed by a nigga who sold 80 million records. You can't take away what we done already. I done been through a lot, dog. And after some time, you just get tired, bro. You just get tired. I had to find more reasons to live this shit. I want step kids or something, dog. Cause my son grown, and, I, and, and seeing him happy, I'm seeing him be successful is the last thing I want on earth. Y'all niggas don't know I, I, I've contemplated suicide. I love God. I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired of Earth, man. I want somebody to take my life, bro. I ask God to take my life, bro. I don't want to do it. Cause that's the shit that nigga been through. I step on shit. No problem. I told my son the other day, I said, you know how, how good I feel knowing you don't have to come up in a life where you gotta pray for your sins. Boy, you, you don't have to worry about it. I said, dog. I've been through a lot. I've been praying for my forgiveness for my whole life. I don't know no other way. I don't know what it feels to be a good citizen. I don't know that shit, dog. I never had that money. From 13, we've been combining on our own, dog. Big gangsters. My nigga, my whole, my, my mama was kids. We ain't had no daddies, all. All that shit y'all niggas got. We ain't got all that money. My big brother was my daddy, dog. And we learned along the way. So I came up in a life where shooting is normal, robbing is normal. That's not my son will have to go through that. He can be a citizen. He can do, he can go do anything in this world. He can be a pilot. <laughs> my fucking son can be a pilot, nigga. I think I give a fuck about these niggas. It ain't even about money no more. This shit ain't even about money, gang. Cause can't no money make me happy. Nigga, my dog asked me the other day. He like, well, what'll make you happy, bro? I'm like, I don't even know, man. It's just, I like doing for people. I just like to be able to, to be there for, I just love to be there for people. That's what, that's what made me happy from day one. I, that's why I even did the band. I don't give a fuck about no music, man. God gave me this talent. This talent is given, bro. You can't take that from me, bro. I do this shit. This shit y'all work hard on, I do in two minutes, man. Two minutes. It take a lot to do this video. I don't even know if I'm gonna release it, but I needed this for my sanity. I had to just break away and talk to myself real quick. But people don't know what a nigga been through to be at, at your highest peak and have it snatched away from you because you don't want to kiss ass. And man, we all black people, man. Black people continue to step on each other and hold each other down. And that shit, that shit for people mental. I'm the nigga that'll run in there and blow your shit loose, bro. I don't give a fuck. You, do you really want to be in a situation where you make a man that mad, dog? Or you take it from a man's family where I gotta sell dope for 20 years and survive in these streets and still don't have a felony, my nigga. I don't have my, my freedom almost taken away from me several times, dog. You hear me? Trying to survive, my nigga. You can't go get no job. You just wanna be regular sometimes. You can't even go get a job. You walk in the job. Hey, it's Freddy P. Uh, what's up, boy? You gotta back up out of what the fuck. You can't even be a regular human no more after some shit like that. But he don't know nothing about that because he don't come from this shit. He don't come from this shit for real. Niggas like that don't come from this shit. Niggas like that don't think about all about hurt. And getting gain, 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 gain. Power, 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 power. Niggas gonna die horribly, man. You niggas gonna die horribly. Test for cancer something, man. God gonna get you, niggas, man. Because you fought with God hard, man. You got a nigga like me who don't even care about no money. I would have did way more for my city than any one of these niggas did. 
Cause I'm from Liberty City, I'm from Old Town. Them niggas just shoot videos though. Them niggas ain't never did shit from Gibson Park, William Park. Them niggas ain't never built no homes for the homeless. Them niggas ain't did nothing I would've did. Them niggas exploited my city, they exploited the culture. Y'all don't know what I'm just telling y'all, man. Be mindful, dog. Appreciate what you what you got, man. But I ain't it's you're not God, bro. When God puts you on the mission to change people's lives, you do what he asks you to do. And you be rewarded. Nigga at 900 million, nigga, you still at nine. Kanye done passed you. Jay done passed you. Cause they don't practice bad business like that. They ain't stepping on each other to get where they gotta go. Nigga, you look at Jay-Z, nigga, Jay, nigga, Dane made millions, Bean made millions. Look at all them niggas around them made real money, nigga. You ain't made a hundred, two hundred thousand with you, nigga. But you done made over 60, 70 million off, 70 million off us, nigga. And we ain't make two hundred thousand a piece off you, nigga. Listen, man. I just want to tell y'all, this music industry ain't what it's seen. I got people in this music industry right now that won't fuck with me. And I was cool with them. They won't fuck with me because of that nigga. Because fucking with me, me and you won't fuck with that nigga. He take it personal. He want to shut doors. So they don't want to have nothing to do with that. And I don't blame him. I blame that nigga. Tell you, man. I done been in this. I just had a, I had to talk to Dylan. I tell my brother what I was going through. My brother, I had to talk to Sean. Sean, Terry, the real people that's up under me know what I'm. This shit, they know I love. I'm, I'm, a fa I'm fascinated with them. I'm ready for the next journey. When you go through what that nigga put put a nigga through for the last twenty years, you get tired, bro. You just. I want to leave this here in case I ever fucking perish, my nigga. You could look back at this, dog. You die before me, dog. How you think I'm gonna feel? You think I'm gonna? You think I'm gonna laugh? Or you think I'm gonna cry? When you die, people pull the cry about you, dog. This world gonna talk bad about you, bro. Granted, this is also for entertainment purposes, but he knows what it takes to have star quality as an artist, so him defending Cassie just shows his sense of favoritism that he had towards her. But her signing a 10 album deal before she even released her first album is a lot because most labels will sign you for like 1-6 to six albums, so 10 is a very large number. Especially since she couldn't sing very well and wasn't fully developed. When Cassie first started her relationship with Diddy, it started off as her trying to keep things professional. But unfortunately, Diddy didn't see it that way, which makes his 2022 BET speech more disrespectful. For a few years, you know what I'm saying? And I have to give a special thank out. Thank you. Shout out. Thank you. All that love. To, I got to give a special thank you to the people that was really like there for me. Bishop T.D. Jakes. My chief of staff, Christina Coram, KK, Lorianne Gibson, keeping me free. Yeah, and also Cassie for holding me down in the dark times. Love. 18 years old, while Diddy was 37. In the beginning, Cassie was grossed out about the large age gap between her and Diddy and saw the relationship as Diddy truly trying to help her. At first, he was nice, of course, by defending her to the public and boasting her as his new up-and-coming artist. Cassie came to New York fairly young, around 18, without her family to guide her, so she saw Diddy as someone she could truly trust initially. She was trying to get her career off the ground, and this was an open opportunity for her. In the court documents, Cassie recalls a night where she had to go to the hospital for unknown reasons. When she was discharged, she was well enough to go out to the club with her friends. That night, Diddy saw her and demanded that she went home to quote-unquote take care of herself. Again, Cassie was embarking on this newfound journey without her family present. So as a 19 year old, she saw it as Diddy looking out for her instead of controlling her, as many young impressionable women would think. 
Diddy would often flaunt himself to Cassie in many ways. As someone whose goal is to get rich and have a successful career, Diddy used his celebrity status and riches to display to Cassie to ensure to her that if she stayed close to him, she could have it too. Cassie was in a relationship during the beginning stages of being on Bad Boy. She was in a relationship with her producer, Ryan Leslie at the time, and Diddy of course knew that. Even though around this time Diddy was with Kim Porter, his relationship with Kim Porter is described as toxic. Kim was very to herself and never spoke out but there's a lot of speculations of what happened in their relationship including signs of harm. His relationship with Kim didn't stop him from inflicting controlling signs to Cassie. Diddy being a power hungry man sought to have something that he couldn't have, repeatedly enforcing his dominance to Cassie by allegedly not allowing her then boyfriend around, enforcing kisses and making her take e-pills regularly so they could be in drug induced experiences together. But one of the first signs she truly saw he would abuse his power was in 2007. Diddy paid a promoter to create a fake booking gig in Miami so she could get away from her boyfriend and spend time with him. Seeing firsthand that he was persistent, she was worried that if she said no to his fake invitation that it would affect her career. He was introducing her to different type of drugs and eventually was able to get her to sleep with him. Within the first few years at Bad Boy, Cassie ended up getting sucked into the life of Diddy. Their relationship and age gap is why many question why a grown man would want to be with someone who is still considered a little girl. The dynamic was one of power and ego. You can't get to where Diddy is by not being self-absorbed. Diddy has been at the height of his career since the 90s and has had the luck and influence regardless of how he got it, he enjoys a dominant power dynamic and used his influence to influence Cassie and that includes manipulating her via his lifestyle and dangling her career potential in her face as long as she followed along. Cassie witnessed many examples of people abiding by Diddy's rules. Whatever he said went no matter the circumstance. Diddy constantly used his wealth to intimidate her by funding her lifestyle and buying her luxurious things. This obviously sounds like the get the bag culture as long as he's buying you designer clothes, shoes, and cars, you're winning. That's why you see so many Instagram girls taking trips to so many different countries and having so many luxurious things but they don't even have a job. As a watcher, you question how were they able to do this not knowing that they could be doing dark things undercover that they would never actually speak about in the open. We see it with his relationship with Carisha and how he lavishes her and created a show for her on his channel on Revolt TV. Carisha is the most open out of all his relationships and shows off the lifestyle he gives her, but also reveals some of the weird things that Diddy likes to do to her. <laughs> I can't say it. You got to. It say take a shot if you like go to showers, I do golden showers meaning when the guy pees on you mm -hmm. he only showed her the apartment with her parents which again you think was a nice gesture but could really be him showing her parents that he had wealth to take care of her it's the same situation with Kamora Lee Simmons Kamora was 17 when she got with a 35 year old Russell and her parents knew the age gap was there but they also knew that Russell was wealthy and had the connections so they turned a blind eye to the age and power dynamics. Cassie's parents said they were quote unquote proud of their daughter's success so they watched and abided. Her music virtually went nowhere. She continued to drop singles to bring some buzz here and there, but it was really just a come and go. People just started to see Cassie as Diddy's girlfriend and arm candy. And I'm sure Cassie knew that also. The relationship was controlled by Diddy and Cassie did whatever he wanted, including shaving the side of her head. Young Jock did an interview for Vlad TV where he said how Cassie ended up shaving her head and it was all because Diddy told her to. Uh, 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 Scarface, when, when that, that, that white woman was coming down the escalator. Yeah. He was in that man's house and he saw that man's wife and was like this. I was watching Puff. And then Puff was looking up there. He saw this, this, this white woman. It was bottles on bottles on bottles around. It was lit. Puff jumped out. Me and Cassie sitting next to each other. My wife right here, Cassie right here. The nigga jumped off the bar, came over and said, Yo, yo, Cassie, tomorrow. I want you to shave the side of your head. And I was like, I'm like, what the fuck kind of request is that? <laughs> like, so when I'm like, what the fuck? So when I look up there, this white woman's side of her head was shaved, my nigga. And the bitch looked good with it. So I was looking at Cassie, I was like, well, I, I was like, you're not about to do that, are you? She said, well, I mean, whatever Sean wants, I'm gonna do. 
Cassie was becoming very engulfed in the relationship with Diddy out of fear and complacency. Her being constantly fueled with drugs was taking a toll on her. She was constantly being watched by his team, which also didn't give her the feelings of a safe space. There are numerous accounts in the court documents about the physical harm Cassie endured under Diddy's hands. Cassie said that he would beat her and would have her go stay at hotels or apartments to let the bruises heal before she stepped out into the real world again. She recalled an instance after parting with Jay-Z, Diddy went into a fit of rage and repeatedly beat and stomped on her in an escalade to the point of tears. He had very jealous tendencies. She usually had to stay to herself or else she would be afraid something was going to happen. There was a moment he had with her, stomping on her stomach and putting hands on her. He had caught me texting another man. We was in Miami and um, it got really crazy that time. Uh, um, we was upstairs and he he had like we were in his closet and he like pushed me and I fell to the ground and um and then he got he like stood over me so I was like laying on my back and he stood over me and he started like punching me like this like he avoided my face but he like started punching me like on the side of the, my head and I was just like covering my face and um he did that he did that and then and then after he got done doing that he like because he was standing his legs were like stay in between me so he like he like stomped on my stomach so it was, like it was, just I was like, like a jealous rage yeah i was like i, I was say? just saying happy birthday nothing else he thought i think he thought i was trying to be sneaky behind his back because i like reach over mm -hmm. when he like leaned forward to talk to somebody else so he thought i was trying to be sneaky and you were how old at this time? Um, I was 22, probably. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Um. And then um, he did this. So King Los was sitting in the back. Okay. And then when we got to the hotel, um, it got even worse. And um, he like he like tried to he took one of my. Sh heels and try to throw it at me and then he like like mush my face and like really hard and made my nose bleed wow and the only person that ever every time me and he like we get into like fights like that the only person that ever helped me was um d-rock everyone else just kind of just allowed it to happen and just like look the other way so most of his entourage were, I guess, enablers. Like his staff. Yeah. Or, yeah. And they wouldn't say anything. They would just watch him. No, just... Not not watch it, but kind of just walk away and just let leave us alone. And not really step in to um, stop. Wow. Now, what made you stay? Because obviously there's baby number two, and then there's more beatings, according to you, that happened after that, because that was just the first time. What made you stay? Um, because I just thought, um, um, I just thought that he was only being like that because he loved me. All from fits of jealousy. This is the same girl that Carisha was going back and forth with on Twitter about Diddy. Some women, unfortunately, keep turning a blind eye to their own torment because of many reasons like Stockholm Syndrome, fear of not being taken care of, or just straight up complacency. You're walking on eggshells around him because you want to feel loved by him. You're craving the love he doesn't give you and you're chasing for it hoping one day he'll give it to you. Carisha made a post saying if she wanted she could have Diddy make her drop down and get on her knees and eat her coochie because she's an eater. And I'm sure became not once but twice, correct? Yes. Okay. When was the first time you became pregnant with uh, Diddy's child? The first time was um, October 2014. Okay. So this was like what, a year after? Um, No, not a year but because I met him in February and then okay. I got pregnant in October. Oh, so the same, the same year. The same year. Okay. And uh, you mind telling me what happened with that pregnancy? Um, he, well, I told him and he was like, 
he was like, you're going to get an abortion, right? And then I was like, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know yet. And then, and then he offered me 50000 to get rid of it. But I turned it down because um, I just... I just loved him and I just, uh, and I wanted, I wanted to, I was like trying to prove that I wasn't the girl that was wanted him, him for money. money. Okay. I just, just care about him. And, um, I just wanted him to be nice to me. That's it. I was like, I don't want your money. I just want you to um, be nice to me. Whether you decide to keep the baby or not. Mm-hmm. So would it be fair to say if that he was an asshole about it? Um, I mean, offering somebody $50,000 to abort a baby, whew, he must really want it gone bad. Um, I mean, in the beginning, like the first three and a half years, he was, I mean, like the first three months, three, four months, he was really nice. But then after that, he was, he started being an asshole. So like I say, like the first Three and a half years, he was like mean to me. So when you say mean, describe it. Um, he was abusive. He was like always belittling me and always like, he, I just he was like mentally, emotionally, and physically abusing me. Did he? Mm-hmm. It's not the first time we've heard that. Mm-hmm. Um, there was an incident, of course, with Cassie when reporters are saying that the police were called because they got into an altercation. This, I think it was like two or three years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, tell me some of the things that he would say to you. Um, he would always compare me to Cassie and tell me that I'm the bad one and she's a good one. Um, and he was with both of you guys at the same time. Yeah. Um, Virginia even talks about how Cassie warned her, literally warned her to leave him alone, not in a vindictive manner, like my man, my man, but as a girl to girl, you can do better while you can. Yeah. Drugs at his home, and one of his security came to the room and said that Suge Knight was down the street at Mel's drive-in. Diddy ran into the safe and got multiple guns and ran out of his home where he thought Suge was. And we all see that little run out the house didn't take him nowhere, now did it? Now, over the decade of their time spent together, he would violently abuse use her leaving bruises on her body and leaving her in hotel for days where she would have to heal up now he kicked and beat her so violently one time after a jay-z party that he ended up kicking her out of the car leaving her to hail a cab back home now in 2009 she was speaking to a music manager about helping her grow her career and diddy became enraged and once again got in his car and began stomping her in the face once the car stopped at Diddy's residence, Cassie tried to run away, but Diddy caught up to her and continued to kick her in the face. He realized how bad he had beat her and got her to a hotel in L.A. where she could heal. She recognized that she was powerless and this man had a team that bowed down to him and no one would tell him that he was doing wrong. She then became numb to the abuse after a while and became beholding and blindly followed his instructions in fear of another vicious beating. He often referred to their relationship as a Bobby and Whitney type of relationship and he also also told her that his fantasy was to see her with another penis. He invited a male sex worker into the home and they all took drugs and they wore masquerade masks. He made her perform sexual acts on this man and Diddy watched and masturbated and directed the acts that they would do next. Now this one encounter lasted multiple days and Diddy referred to this arrangement as a freak off or an F.O. roles in movies like Step Up 2. All right, the big news, though, there's a new movie called The Perfect Match. It comes out tomorrow, and she's terrific in it. Let's see a trailer and then meet the star. <laughs> Relationships. Why are we friends with him? Because he's the best hoe we ever met in our life. Take us on a bet. You date a woman and see if you get attached. I want to try something new. No expectations. No strings. For the first time, I actually allowed myself Cassie, to Cassie, <laughs> welcome to Good Day, New York. Thank you. Not you. Tell me so this. I heard you kind of turn the tables on the guys in this movie. I like yeah. the, the whole premise of this. Yes, it's a little bit of a switch up, a, a total energy change. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what was happening in that trail. So what's, what, <laughs> set it up, oh, big picture. The I'm perfect gonna, match is... I'm going to set it up for you. So Charlie Mack is this player. Um, he doesn't fall in love. He doesn't take advantage of women, but he definitely 
has his time with them, and then he kind of leaves them aside. He won't commit. He won't commit, and yes. he goes through a lot of women and makes that very clear in the beginning of the movie. Um, and Eva over, it, my character, overhears a bet that he has with his friends to see if he can stay faithful to one girl until his friend's wedding. Um, she overhears it and takes advantage of the opportunity to have a casual relationship, which is kind of unheard of, and that he wants the same thing, so that maybe they would work out, or that would work out so for them. So let me ask you, in the movie you have, I guess, you know, uh, some very intimate scenes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm wondering about the boyfriend, <laughs> Diddy, whether he came to the set to make sure everything was copacetic with you. No, he actually uh, really trusted the situation. Him and Terrence spoke beforehand because Terrence... Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, you date P. Diddy? Oh, wow. I did not know this. Yeah. <laughs> Hold yes, the phone. Craig. You know, yes. I normally, I typically don't talk about my private life. Well, but forgive me, they put it on the television. They put it, they put it on the television. Yeah, so, yeah, I okay. mean, I, I don't go, like, really, you're your I'll business. I'll let that one go. So, uh, all right. But wait, she was telling the story that... So, so yeah, okay, so, so Terrence was a bit nervous, um, and I told uh, Puff about it, and he said, to have him give me a call. So we FaceTimed, and they had their man talk, and he said, make it believable. You guys, this is, like, going to be a great movie for you, and he's proud of us at the end of the day. Oh, it's, the, it's the, work. The actor talked to Puff. Yeah. So I didn't know you call him Puff. Yeah, Puff, I, Sean. Yeah. I think That's everybody nice. has their different names. Well, he seems like a good guy. I met him it's once when he was selling uh, Ciroc vodka. Yes. <laughs> he yeah. Had a big, he brought a big <laughs> jug He's of a it. big mogul. By the way, um, Cassie comes from our area, Connecticut. Yes, from Connecticut. Do you still have uh, family there? I do, in New London, Connecticut. Oh, that's yes. nice. You getting a chance to see them while you're here? Yeah, they came. We had a screening last night, and they came to it. It was really nice oh, to be with them. That's nice. All right, yeah. you can catch Cassie, the perfect match, tomorrow in theaters everywhere. Yes. So nice to meet you nice in person. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you so much. Say a little puff for us. Yeah, I will. text him and say, <laughs> we, say we said hi. Can, I we, can we FaceTime him? What we the heck? Can, let's do it later, yes. Yeah, yes. all right, cool. He's in California. I always wanted to hang with him. Um, All right, there is a new <laughs> restaurant. Just like many of Diddy's artists, like Danny D. Kane, Mace, and Day26, they all didn't exceed to the level of fame that they could have. Even one of Diddy's thought or they would think that I had anything to do with any kind of gunplay, they weren't gonna fuck with me, and they not gonna fuck with me. He said, um, I'm a businessman. I'm about making money. But something gotta change. I don't give a fuck if Pac gotta die, Big gotta die, or shouldn't I go to jail? 